Conducting your analyses. The learning objectives for this section are 1. Describe the steps involved in preparing and analyzing a typical set of raw data. And 2. Differentiate between planned and exploratory data analyses. Even when you understand the statistics involved, analyzing data can be a complicated process. It's likely that for each of several participants, there are data for several different variables. Demographics, such as sex and age, one or more independent variables, one or more dependent variables, and perhaps a manipulation check. Furthermore, the raw or unanalyzed data might take several different forms, completed paper and pencil questionnaires, computer files filled with numbers or text, videos or written notes, and these may have to be organized, coded, or combined in some way. There might even be missing, incorrect, or just suspicious responses that must be dealt with. In this section, we consider some practical advice to make this process as organized and as efficient as possible. Prepare your data for analysis. Whether your raw data are on paper or in a computer file, or both, there are a few things you should do before you begin analyzing them. First, be sure that they don't include any information that might identify individual participants, and be sure that you have a secure location where you can store the data and a separate secure location where you can store any consent forms. Unless the data are highly sensitive, a locked room or a password-protected computer is usually good enough. It's also a good idea to make photocopies or backup files of your data and store them in yet another secure location, at least until the project is complete. Professional researchers usually keep a copy of their raw data and consent forms for several years in case questions about the procedure, the data, or participant consent arise after the project is completed. Next, you should check your raw data to make sure that they're complete and appear to have been accurately recorded, whether it was participants, yourself, or a computer program that did the recording. At this point, you might find that there are illegible or missing responses or obvious misunderstandings, for example, a response of 12 on a 1 to 10 rating scale. You'll have to decide whether such problems are severe enough to make a participant's data unusable. If information about the main independent or dependent variable is missing, or if several responses are missing or suspicious, you may have to exclude that participant's data from the analyses. If you do decide to exclude any data, don't throw them away or delete them, because you or another researcher might want to see them later. Instead, set them aside and keep notes about why you decided to exclude them because you'll need to report this information. Now you're ready to enter your data in a spreadsheet program, or, if it's already in a computer file, to format it for analysis. You can use a general spreadsheet program, like Microsoft Excel, or a statistical analysis program, like SPSS or PSPP, to create your data file. Data files created in one program can usually be converted to work with other programs. The most common format is for each row to represent a participant and for each column to represent a variable, with a variable name at the top of each column. A sample data file is shown in Table 12.6. The first column contains participant identification numbers. This is followed by columns containing demographic information, like sex and age, the independent variables, mood and four self-esteem items, and the total of the self-esteem items, and finally, dependent variables, which were intentions and attitudes. Categorical variables can be entered as a category label, label, like M or F for male and female, or as numbers, such as zero for negative mood and one for positive mood. Although category labels are often clearer, some analyses might require numbers. SPSS allows you to enter numbers, but also attach a category label to each number. If you have multiple response measures, such as the self-esteem measure in table 12.6, you could combine them, the items by hand and then enter the total score in your spreadsheet. However, it's much better to enter each response as a separate variable in the spreadsheet, as with the self-esteem measure in table 12.6, and use the software to combine them, for example, using the average function in Excel or the compute function in SPSS. Not only is this approach more accurate, but it allows you to detect and correct errors, to assess internal consistency, 
and to analyze individual responses if you decide to do so later. Preliminary analyses. Before turning to your primary research questions, there are often several preliminary analyses to conduct. For multiple response measures, you should assess the internal consistency of the measure. Statistical programs like SPSS will allow you to compute Kronbach's alpha or Cohen's K or kappa. If this is beyond your comfort level, you can still compute and evaluate a split half correlation. Next, you should analyze each important variable separately. This step is not necessary for manipulated independent variables, of course, because you as the researcher determined what the distribution would be. Make histograms for each variable, note their shapes, and compute the common measures of central tendency and variability. Be sure you understand what these statistics mean in terms of the variables you're interested in. For example, a distribution of self-report happiness ratings on a 1 to 10 point scale might be unimodal and negatively skewed with a mean of 8.25 and a standard deviation of 1.14. But what this means is that most participants rated themselves fairly high on the happiness scale, with a small number rating themselves notice noticeably lower. Now is the time to identify outliers, examine them more closely, and decide what to do about them. You might discover that what at first appears to be an outlier is the result of a response being entered incorrectly in the data file, in which case you only need to correct the data file and move on. Alternatively, you might suspect that an outlier represents some other kind of error, misunderstanding, or a lack of effort by the participant. For example, in a reaction time distribution in which most participants took only a few seconds to respond, a participant who took three minutes to respond would be an outlier. It seems likely that the participant didn't understand the task or at least wasn't paying very close attention. Also, including the reaction time would have a large impact on the mean and standard deviation for the sample. In situations like this, it can be justifiable to exclude the outlying response or participant from the analyses. If you do this, however, you should keep notes on which responses or participants you've excluded and why, and apply those same criteria consistently to every response and every participant. When you present your results, you should indicate how many responses or participants you excluded and the specific criteria that you used. And again, don't literally throw away or delete the data that you choose to exclude. Just set them aside because you or another researcher might want to see them later. Keep in mind that outliers don't necessarily re represent an error, misunderstanding, or a lack of effort. They might represent truly extreme responses or participants. For example, in one large university student sample, the vast majority of participants reported having had fewer than 15 sexual partners, but there were also a few extreme scores of 60 or 70. Although these scores might represent errors, misunderstandings, or even intentional exaggerations, it is also plausible that they re represent honest and even accurate estimates. One strategy here would be to use the median and other statistics that are not strongly affected by the outliers. Another would be to analyze the data, both including and excluding any outliers. If the results are essentially the same, which they often are, then it makes sense to leave the outliers. If the results differ depending on whether the outliers are included or excluded, then both analyses can be reported and the differences between them discussed. Planned and exploratory analyses. Finally, you're ready to answer your primary research questions. When you designed your study, you might have had a hypothesis that a particular relationship might exist in the data. In this case, you would conduct a planned analysis to test the relationship that you expected in your hypothesis. For example, if you expected a difference between group or condition means, you can compute the relevant group or condition means in standard deviations, make a bar graph to display the results, and compute Cohen's D. If you expected a correlation between quantitative variables, you can make a line graph or scatter plot, be sure to make, make sure you check for nonlinearity and restriction of range, and you can compute Pearson's R. Once you've conducted your plan analyses, you can move on to examine the possibility that there might be relationships in the data that you didn't hypothesize. This would be an exploratory analysis, an analysis that you're undertaking without an existing hypothesis. 
These analyses will help you explore your data for other interesting results that might provide the basis for future research and material for the discussion section of your paper. Daryl Bem suggests that you examine your data from every angle, analyze the sexes separately, make up new composite index indexes. If a datum suggests a new hypothesis, try to find additional evidence for it elsewhere in the data. If you see dim traces of interesting patterns, try to reorganize the data to bring them into bolder relief. If there are participants you don't like, or trials, observers, or interviewers who gave you anomalous results, drop them temporarily. Go on a fishing expedition for something, anything interesting. It's important to differentiate planned from exploratory analyses in writing your results and discussion sections of your report. This is because complex set sets of data are likely to include patterns that occurred entirely by chance. And every time you do another unplanned analysis on the data, you increase the likelihood that these chance patterns will appear to be real patterns, what is referred to as a type one error, as we'll discuss in the next chapter. Thus, results discovered while doing exploratory analyses, what BEM calls a fishing expedition, should be viewed skeptically and replicated in at least one new study before being presented. But if you do find interesting relationships you don't expect in the data, explain that they might be worthy of additional research. Understand your descriptive statistics. In the next chapter, we'll consider inferential statistics, a set of techniques for deciding whether the results of your sample are likely to apply to the population. Although inferential statistics are important for reasons that will be explained shortly, beginning researchers sometimes forget that their descriptive statistics really tell what happened in their study. For example, imagine that a treatment group of 50 participants has a mean score of 34.32 and a standard deviation of 10.45, and a control group of 50 participants has a mean score of 21.45 with a standard deviation of 9.22, and Cohen's D is an extremely strong 1.31. Although conducting and reporting inferential statistics, like a t-test, would certainly be required a re required part of any formal report on the study, it should be clear from the descriptive statistics alone that the treatment worked. Or imagine that a scatter plot shows an indistinct cloud of points and Pearson's R is a trivial negative 0 0.02. Again, although conducting or reporting inferential statistics would be a required part of any formal report on the study, again, it should be clear that the, from these descriptive statistics alone that the variables are essentially unrelated. The point is that you should always be sure that you thoroughly understand your results at a descriptive level first and then move on to the inferential statistics.